Hello, my name is Mr. Asprey, and this is Edexcel A Level Maths Paper Free June 2018 Stats and Mechanics. This is a really good paper for practice. Uh, some really tricky questions in there, particularly number five statistics on conditional probability. That one's a really good one. And then we've also got um, mechanics. There is a moments question, which is really tricky. And also the final projectiles question involves some seriously techie substitutions and rearrangements. So give this paper a go. And if you find the solutions useful, then please do like, subscribe and share. Let's get into the maths. Question number one, Helen believes that the random variable C representing cloud cover from the large data set can be modeled as a discrete. So discrete means that there's a certain number, like a finite number of entries, um, which is the opposite of continuous, where there's an infinite number of possibilities. And it says uniform, uh, which means all the probabilities are the same. So the possibilities for cloud cover from the large data set are from zero to eight because they're measured in what are called octas. So I'm gonna to have to draw a table here um, for each possibility. And if there are nine possibilities and it's a uniform distribution, it means that the probability that um, we get any of these values is going to be the same, which is going to be a ninth. So the key part here is to know that cloud cover is measured in octas and there are nine possibilities. Using this model, find the probability that the cloud cover is less than 50%. Okay, so the probability that cloud cover is less than four. Um, well, how many are there? There are one, two, three, four. There are four possibilities. So that would be four out of nine. Uh, so I figured that out because, um, well, four would be the median so if we want it to be less than 50%, then it needs to be less than four. Okay, um, Helen used all the data from the large data set for Hearn in 2015 and found that the proportion of days with cloud cover of less than 50% was 0 0.315. Comment on the suitability of Helen's model in light of this information. Well, the probability that she achieved First off, let's just double check what four out of uh, nine is. Um, whoops, don't know why it says subscribe there. So four out of nine is 44.4%. Okay, so her probability um, is lower than the suggested model. So the actual probability is lower than expected and this suggests the model is not good because well 31% is, is way different compared to 44% uh, okay part D suggests an appropriate refinement to the model um, basically use a non-uniform distribution. Perfect. Tessa owns a small clothes shop in a seaside town. She records the weekly sale figures and the average temperature for eight weeks during the summer. The product moment coefficient for the data is minus 0.9. 915 state the hypothesis clearly using 5% significance level test whether or not the correlation between the sales figures and average weekly temperature is negative okay so the uh, hypothesis that we need to state we always start with h0 and for correlation we write rho and the um, 
The null hypothesis is that it's equal to zero. That's always the case. And H1 is the alternate hypothesis. In this case, it's less than zero because we're testing for negative correlation. Okay, we then go to our um, formula book and we find our critical value. So we're going to need the, uh, the number of events. There are eight of them and the significance level is 5%. So we turn to the page where we get the product moment coefficient and we've got 5% at the top, we've got 8 up on the side and that tells us that the critical value is 0 0.6215. Critical value is equal to 0 0.6215. Okay, so we now compare this critical value to our test statistic which is negative 0 0.8. One five. So what we say is the um, the modulus of R is equal to the modulus of minus zero point nine one five, which is equal to zero point nine one five. The reason why we take the modulus is so that we can compare it to the critical value, which is always positive. So we compare it by saying that the um, uh, the value of our test statistic is greater than the critical value. And this means that we accept H1 uh, because there is correlation. This uh, test statistic is extremely correlated. It's bigger than our critical value, so that is enough evidence. So we say that that is evidence to suggest a negative correlation. Okay, great. Um, next, we go up to part B, suggest a possible reason for this correlation. Well, this is a, um, a small clothes shop on a seasized town, and, that, and the temperature is the other variable. So the temperature goes up, the sales go down, apparently, um, maybe because people are spending more time at the beach. So we can say just that. So we can say that as temperature increases, people spend more time at the beach and less time shopping. Okay, part C. Tessa suggests that a linear regression model could be used to model this data. State giving a reason whether or not the correlation coefficient is consistent with Tessa's suggestion. Um, the answer is yes, it is. And um, uh, because the um, our value is close to minus one. So it's strongly correlated, which means that all of the values will be in pretty much a straight line. So we can use a regression model to model that. Okay, next one. Um, it's a state giving reason which variable would be the explanatory variable. Okay, so the explanatory variable um, is another another word for the independent variable. And this would be uh, the temperature. Because the temperature is completely independent of the um, sales whereas the sales is completely dependent upon the temperature. For example, the temperature doesn't change just because of someone buying a pair of shoes, whereas people might buy shoes because the temperature has changed, thus making the temperature the independent variable and the sales the dependent variable. Okay, next, moving on, um, part E. Tessa calculated the regression equation as this. Give an interpretation of the gradient of this regression equation. Okay, so um, this means that for every uh, degree uh, rise in temperature, and let's just double check that. 
So this means essentially the gradient is this, and it means so if you go one along on the t-axis, you go down 171. So one along would be one degree because it's measured in degrees, and this means she records a weekly sales figure of of w pounds. So for every one you go along, you go down. 171 pounds per week. So every degree rise in temperature leads to a drop of 171 pounds in weekly earnings. Question three. In an experiment, a group of children are repeatedly, uh, each or each repeatedly throw a dart at a target. For each child, the random variable h represents the number of times the dart hits the target in the first 10 throws. State two assumptions uh, Peter needs to make to use her model. Well, that is, um, the first one is that the throws are independent. So they don't get any better after throwing you know three or four darts they just stay consistent um, from one dart to the nut to the next the, the probability won't change um, and also that um, um, the probability of each child um, hitting is constant so we're not going to get like one child who's really good and one guy who's just not so good. Um, using Pitter's model, find the probability that H is greater than or equal to 4. Okay, so we're just going to go to our calculator to do this. And we are going to go into statistics mode. And we're going to go to distribution, binomial, we're going to go for CD, and the variable we want the lowest it possibly could be is 4, the upper is 10, and the number of trials is 10. And the probability was 0 0.1. So we do that, and we can just state that probability as 0 0.0127, or 1280. Okay, great. Moving on. For each child, the random variable f represents the number of the throw on which the dart first hits the target. Using Peter's assumptions about this experiment, find the probability f is equal to 5. Okay, so for in order for the person to hit it on the fifth attempt, they must... Um, Part C. They must first, well the first attempt must be a miss, and then a second must be a miss, the third must be a miss, the fourth must be a miss, and then the fifth must be a hit. So we can do that on our calculator by going to menu, run matrix, uh, 0 0.9 to the power of uh, 4, and then multiply by 0 0.1. And we get 0 0.06561. Okay, great. Um, Thomas assumes that in this experiment, no child would need more than 10 throws for the dart to hit the target for the first time. He models the probability of f is equal to n as this, where alpha is a constant. Find the value of alpha. Okay, so let's have a look at what would happen when n is equal to um, 1. So when n equals 1, we will get just 0 0.01. Um, when n equals 2, we will get uh, 0 0.01 plus 1 alpha. When n equals 3, we will get 0 0.01 plus plus 2 alpha 
And this will go on and on and on until we eventually get to n equals 10. And that will be 0 0.01 plus 9 alpha. Okay, so this is an arithmetic sequence. And we're going to sum this up. So we're going to sum up all the probabilities because we're going to want all the probabilities to equal 1. Because remember, it says that the guy wants everyone to hit it within 10 throws. So that means that everyone has either a probability of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. Okay, so we're going to sum them up. And the number of possibilities are 10. So 10 over 2. The first term times by 2 will be this. Plus n minus 1 is 9 multiplied by the difference, um, which is alpha. And we're going to equal that to 1. OK, so solving this, we're going to get, um, let's divide both sides by 5 and multiply uh, this by 2. Plus 9 alpha is equal to, divide by 5 is going to give me 0 0.2. So that's going to give you that 9 alpha is equal to 0 0.18. So dividing through by 9, get alpha is equal to 0 0.02. Perfect. OK, next part. Using Thomas's model, find the probability that f is equal to 5. OK, so just we can do that up here because uh, all we're doing is subbing in n is equal to 5. So it's 0 0.01 plus 5 minus 1 is 4 times by alpha, which we said was 0 0.02. So that is going to be just 0 0.09. Explain how Peter's and Thomas's models differ by describing the probability that the dart hits the target in this experiment. Okay, so as we said at the start, Peter's model suggests that the probability of hitting the target is constant, whereas we can see from Thomas's model, the probability of hitting the target increases each time. So essentially they get better and better as they go along, meaning that it, they improve and they get more likely to hit the target after more attempts. Question number four, Charlie is studying the time it takes members of his company to travel to the office. He stands by the door to the office from blah to blah one morning and asks workers as they arrive how long their journey was. State the sampling method Charlie used. Um, this is, I believe, called opportunity sampling. He's just taken a particular opportunity, a particular slime slot and just gone with it. Um, or you could also call it convenience sampling. State and briefly describe an alternative method of non-random sampling Charlie could have used to obtain a sample of 40 workers. Um, he could have done perhaps a quota sampling and he could have taken um, four uh, people sort of every 10 minutes. Uh, and that way he gets more of a, right, a wide range of times at which people come into the office rather than just one slot where, for example, there might be a train which arrives at 40 and all the people are going to be getting the train. But if you take it over 10 minutes, different intervals, you're going to get different um, a variation of people. OK, um, this person asks every member of the, of the company the time and X minutes it takes to travel to the office. So that type of selection is a census when you just basically just interview the whole population. And they're summarised in this box plot. OK, write down the interquartile range for these data. So this is the uh, lower quartile, which is 26. This is the upper quartile, which is 56. So the interquartile range is 50, sorry, 58 minus 26, which is um, 32. And that's in minutes. OK, 
calculate the mean and standard deviation of um, of these data. Okay, so we're going to need to use the formula for this and our calculators. And the formula is for the standard deviation of the mean first. Um, the mean is the sum of the x's divided by the um, number of bits of data. So I'll do that calculation there. And that will um, give me 43.5. So x bar is equal to the sum of x over n, which is equal to 43.5. OK, and the standard deviation. The standard deviation sigma is equal to the square root of the sum of the x's over n minus the sum of x over n all squared. So I would... Um, Go to my calculator and I would press the square root of the sum of the x's all over n minus essentially the mean squared. So I could just press previous answer squared. That gives me 15.4. That's great. Um, state giving a reason whether you would recommend using the mean and standard deviation or the median and interquartile range to describe this data. Okay, let's have a look at the data. And the only thing that stands out here is the fact that um, we have these outliers. And the outliers affect the mean, but they don't affect the median and they affect the standard deviation, but they don't affect the interquartile range. So the answer for this one would be um, due to outliers affecting uh, mean and standard deviation, median and interquartile range better fit. Okay, um, they both work for the company and have moved houses since the person collected the data. Um, this person's journey has changed from 75 to 35 and David's journey has changed from 60 to 33 minutes. Um, they drew the box plot again and only had to change two values. Explain which two values they must have changed and whether each of these values has increased or decreased. Okay, let's go back and look at the data again. Okay, so um, these outliers, they won't change because they're not affected by, they're not these numbers, they're not 60 or 75. Um, this here, that won't change either, because again, they're not 60 or 75. Um, 20 down the bottom, that won't change because they're not 33 or 35. They're not being pushed down even further. Um, and furthermore, um, the lower quarter won't change either because that's at 26. And um, none of these values are going to be lower than 26 when they've been changed. What will change, however, is the median, because the numbers 75 and 60 turning into 35 and 33, they were higher than the median, and now they're going to be lower than the median. So it's going to push the median to the left. And it's the same with the upper quartile as well, um, because those numbers which were higher than the upper quartile are now going to be lower than it. So that's going to push that to the left as well. So the answer to part G, I'm not going to write it down, I'm just going to say it once more, is that it's the median and the upper quartile because these numbers were higher than those values, but now they're lower than it, therefore they need to be shifted. Question 5. The lifetime L of a battery has a normal distribution with mean 18 hours and standard deviation 4 hours. As this calculator requires four batteries and will stop working when one battery reaches the end of its lifetime. 
Find the probability that a randomly selected battery will last for longer than 16 hours. Okay, so let's just write down that distribution. We have a normal distribution with a mean of 18 and a standard deviation of 4. So we write 4 squared in there. And what calculation do we want? We want a random one um, probability that will last longer than 16 hours. So we want the probability that X is greater than 16 for part A. Normal distribution doesn't matter if it's greater than or equal to if it's continuous data. Um, okay, so statistic mode, distribution, normal, normal CD. We want the lower to be 16. We want the upper to be just a huge number. And we need the standard deviation to be 4 and the mean to be 18. And this gives us 6915. Okay, perfect. Okay. At the start of her exams, Alice puts four new batteries into her calculator. And she has used a calculator for 16 hours and has another four hours left. Find the probability that her calculator will stop working um, for the remainder of the exams. Okay, so this is a very tricky question, this. First off, what we need to do is we need to work out the probability that a single battery will last more than 20 hours um, given that it's already lasted 16 hours so that's conditional probability so we would write that as the probability of both of these two things happening simultaneously so the intersection which is actually just the probability that um, the calculator battery will last 20 or more hours over the probability what's given which is that the, that the battery lasted for 16 hours or more okay because the top line is the intersection of both of these things happening and for it to last more than 20 and more than 16 it will have to last just more than 20 okay um, so what we'll need to do, we know already what the probability is of it lasting more than 16. That is this. We've now got to find what's the chance of it lasting more than 20. So we go back to our calculator and we just change this to 20. And we get 0 0.3085. This is more like it as well. This is this is this is the stats that we want to be doing, not the previous questions all that writing down and seaside and correlation this is this is the good stuff probability okay right uh, so I got distracted let's actually do this calculation then let's do 0 0.3085 over 0 0.6915 okay 0 0.4461 uh, so this is equal to 0 0.4461. So essentially, that is the probability that one of the batteries is going to stay on for 20 or more hours, given that it's already stayed on for 16 hours. But Alice needs more than that. She needs that to happen four times. So we need a binomial distribution with... Um, we want uh, four trials, there are four batteries, and the chance of it staying on um, and meeting her requirements is this. And we want the probability that all four do this. So that's essentially just going to be 0 0.461 to the power of four. Because we need it to happen, well, we need all four of them to, to stay on, don't we? Um, okay, so we just raise that previous answer to the power of four. And that is, oof, that's not looking good for Alice, is it? 0 0.03961. 
Okay, so that is the chance of her uh, keeping her calculator running. Right, let's go back up. Um, Alice only has two new batteries. So after the first 16 hours of her exams, although her calculator is still working, she randomly selects two of the batteries from her calculator and replaces these with the two new batteries. Well, that's risky. Show that the probability that her calculator will not stop working for the remainder of her exams is 0 0.199 to three significant figures. Okay, so the way this is worded, I just need to just double check that I've got the right idea, which is really always a good idea. Will not stop working means that it will just continue. It will run smoothly. It, it won't break, basically. Uh, the calculator batteries won't run out. So two of them are brand new. Um, well, it's not guaranteed, actually, that they will stay on. What we need is the probability that they last four or more. because so they've still got four hours, even though they're brand new. They've still got to last the four hours. And there are two of those. And there are two of the um, old ones that which need to last 20, given that they've lasted 16 already. So I'm going to square each of these because, again, there are two. So I need that to happen and then it to happen again. And I need this to happen and it to happen again. And that will cover all four batteries. Okay, so we'll need to go to um, back to statistics mode. And we will need to go back to the distribution normal. And this time we need them to last only four hours. And that's, I mean, that's highly likely, isn't it? So that's um, three nines, seven, six, seven. which needs to be squared and then multiplied by this one, which we've already calculated was 0 0.4461 also need to be squared. So I'm gonna to have to do that in run matrix. Um, 0 0.999767 squared multiplied by 0 0.4461 squared. Okay, 0 0.199, I think that's what we're, yeah, that's what we've been asked to, to calculate, 0 0.199, so that's good. Okay, that was part um, C. After her exams, Alice believed that the lifetime of the batteries was more than 18 hours. She took a random sample of 20 of these batteries and found that their mean lifetime was 19.2 hours. Stating your hypothesis clearly and using the 5% significance level, test Alice's belief. Okay, so this is um, a hypothesis test of a normal sample. So we've got to be very careful here. We're going to start off, as always, with the, um, with the null hypothesis. And that is that the average time was 18 hours, as it was stated originally. But Alice believes that the calculator batteries are better than that. They last longer, so greater than 18. And we've got a sample mean here because, remember, we um, Alice says that um, she's taken a sample of 20 of these batteries. So we're not testing the whole population. We're just testing a sample. So we say that's normally distributed. We're going to assume the mean stays the same in order to compare it to any changes. And the um, standard deviation we're going to divide by the square root of 20. And then we're going to say that this is squared to give it the variance. And thus, that is our distribution. So remember, whenever we do the sample, we always have to divide the standard deviation by the square root of n. Um, in order to test the sample mean. Okay, now what was the test statistic? Um, she found that the mean lifetime was 19.2 hours. So we need to see how likely that is to happen. So what's the probability that this distribution 
gives us greater than 19.2. Because if it was 19.2, that's great, but also if it's greater than, then that shows even more of a reason of why the lifetime is greater. And also remember, this symbol here is likely or pretty much certain to dictate what this symbol inside of the um, probability which you need to work out is. Okay, so we're going to have to um, work out what that probability is. So we're going to go to our calculator, back into statistic mode, back into the normal distribution, and we're going to want that to be 19.2. Uh, we keep that as a large number. Um, the standard deviation has now changed. It is now 4 divided by the square root of 20. 18 remains the same. And we get a probability of 0 0.09886. Sorry, 8986. Yeah, perfect. Okay, right, we're testing that against the significance level, which is uh, 5%. So we say that uh, 0 0.08986 is greater than 0 0.05. And that means that this event, which Alice is testing, is likely to happen, given the old mean of 18. So therefore, we say, accept H0, reject H1. There is not significant evidence to suggest Alice's claim is correct. Because once again, the probability that of her um, test statistic is actually greater than the significance level so therefore we say it's likely to happen and therefore there's no reason for us to suggest the mean has changed because we have a likelihood of this happening with the old mean of 18 which we've just tested against. Section B, mechanics, yay! I love mechanics I like stats. I think that's fair. I love mechanics. I like stats. What do you love? What do you like? Do you prefer stats or mechanics? Let me know. Okay, here we go. Um, we have this constant, uh, not constant, this is variable because there's a T involved. So I remember PVA, Patrick Van Aardholt, the Crystal Palace left back. And we take velocity, we integrate it upwards to get position. So that's exactly what I'll do. And what I like to do is I like to write my uh, vectors as columns. I find it easier to deal with rather than writing I's and J's personally. So we write this and then R is equal to the integral of this. So that will give me that R is equal to uh, up the power divided by the new power is going to give me 2t to the half. And here, up the power divided by the new power is going to give me minus t squared, minus 2t squared, sorry. And there will be always a plus c. But I don't think this is going to be, um, that's not going to be important actually, because we are just going to work out the distance between a and b. We're not going to actually work out the exact position um, because there will be a constant added on, but the constant will be the same when we substitute in t is equal to 1 and t is equal to 4, and they will cancel because we're looking at the difference between the two points. Okay, so let's just sub in t is equal to 1, and that will give me a position of uh, 2 on top and minus 2 on bottom, and again, we could say plus c there for the purists. And we've got t is equal to 4, r is equal to um, root makes uh, 2 times 2 is 4, 
and 4 squared is 16 times 5 minus 2 is minus 32 and again plus some constant okay um, so we need to work out the distance between them and we will therefore look at the distance between the x values or the i directions so we've got two there and four there so the gap between them will be two and we square um, the change in the in the i's and the change in the j's is going to be 30 so we add 30 squared. So using Pythagoras, we have just worked out the gap between the i's, the gap between the j's, squared them, added them together, square rooted to get the exact distance. And notice again, the c's, they're not going to matter because they're the same on both sides, so they're going to cancel. It's not going to change the gap between the two um, uh, components. Right, to the calculator we go. And we get 2 squared plus 30 squared square rooted. So the exact distance is 2 square root 226. Beautiful. Question 7. A wooden crate of mass 20 kilograms is pulled on a straight line. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, that is important, actually. Rough. Horizontal floor. Uh, blah, 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 blah. This is important, and in fact, as soon as I see that, I draw myself a little right angle triangle, I put alpha in the corner, the opposite is three, the adjacent is four, that's a three, four, five triangle, and that is gonna help me out, because now I know that sine alpha is equal to three over five, and I know that cos alpha is equal to four over five. The tension in the handle is 40, the coefficient of friction between the uh, floor in the crate is 0.14, blah, 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 that's not important. Find the acceleration of the crate. Six marks, okay, makes me think I've got a bit of work to do. Um, draw on the reactional force, or the normal force, uh, whatever you want to call it. And there's going to be weight, of course, which is going to equal 20g. And um, this 40 degree uh, force, sorry, 40 Newton force can be split into components. This will be 40 cos alpha. And this will be, uh, going up this way, this will be 40 sine alpha. Sine alpha because it's opposite the angle. Cos alpha because it's adjacent to the angle. It's a good way of remembering it. Okay. So let's first off resolve um, vertically so that we can find out what N is, which we'll then be able to use to work out the friction. So resolving vertically, we've got N going up and 40 sine alpha going up and 20 G going down. So that means we have N plus 40 sine alpha is equal to 20 G. So N is equal to 20 G minus 40. And we said that sine alpha was three over five. So we can go to our calculator and we can press um, 20 times 9.8 minus 40 times three over five. That gives 172. Great. Okay, and now we can work out what the frictional force is. Um, so the frictional force, the maximum frictional force, is always equal to mu multiplied by um, R, which is the reaction. And in hindsight, I don't know why I called it the normal. Apologies. Let's always stick with R. Um, that's much better. 
half a reaction force. Apologies. Okay, um, so this means that we do 0 0.14 multiplied by R, which is 172. So this gives us our frictional force of 24.08. Okay, so if the if the um, object is being dragged that way, because that's where the force is going, the frictional force is going to be acting in this direction, always opposing the motion. Um, so that was, sorry, 24.808 going that way. Okay, so now, again, this is the direction of motion, like here, and we can do an F equals MA to work out what the acceleration is. So let's do an F equals MA for the horizontal. So we've got this 40 cos alpha going to the right, we've got 24.08 going to the left, so that's the sum of the forces. So the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration, and we have 40 cos alpha going in the direction of motion, minus 24.08 going against motion, and that's equal to the mass, which is 20 times by the acceleration. So from here, we should just be able to solve for A by doing 40 times by cos alpha, which was 4 over 5, minus um, the previous answer. And I'm going to then divide all that by 20. So I get 0 0.396. And that is meters per second to the minus 2. Okay, explain briefly, oh no, sorry, the crate is now pushed along the same floor using the handle. The handle is again inclined at the same angle to the floor and the thrust in the handle is 40 newtons as shown below. Explain briefly why the acceleration of the crate would now be less than the acceleration of the crate in part A. Okay, so there's going to be a, um, a downwards force now as opposed to an upwards force. Um, so this is going to be pushing it against the floor, which is going to increase the frictional force, which is therefore going to reduce the overall acceleration. So because we're pushing downwards, uh, we'll have a force coming down here and we have a force coming down here. And those will be equal to the reactional force going up here. So R will increase in order to balance the two forces now going down. And if R increases, that means the frictional force will also increase. And therefore, that means the overall acceleration will decrease for those reasons. Okay, question eight, we have um, a particle moves with constant acceleration, which means SUVAT at t equals zero, the particle is at the origin and moving with a velocity. At t equals um, two, then it is moving, oh, it is at the position vector, this. Show that the magnitude of the acceleration is 2.5. Okay, so it seems to me like we have um, we have the position as um, as seven minus ten. Uh, we have the initial velocity of two minus three. Um, the final velocity no. The acceleration is what we're trying to find, and t is two when we're at that particular position. So tell V to do one, which means we need to use S equals UT plus a half AT squared. I hope everyone knows their SUVATs off by heart. They don't really need to because they are in the formula book. Uh, two minus three times by two plus one half of A multiplied by two squared. 
Okay, um, let's tidy this up a bit. This is equal to uh, 4 minus 6. And a half times, uh, that's, that's just 2. So that's 2a, two, um, 2a. Two okay, so let's um, subtract that from that side, which gives me 3. Um, add that to that side, it's going to give me minus 4 is equal to 2a. So therefore we're going to get a is equal to 1.5 and minus 2. So the modulus of a is the square root of 1.5 squared plus 2 squared or minus 2 squared, same thing. So that is square root of 1.5 squared plus 2 squared 2.5. Oh gosh, that's what they ordered us to get. Let me just show that question. Brilliant. Okay, um, next part. At the instant when P leaves the point A, the acceleration of P changes so that P now moves with constant acceleration, blah, blah, blah. At the instant when P reaches point B, the direction of motion is northeast. Find the time it takes for P to travel from A to B. Okay, so first off, what does it mean by northeast? That means it's traveling in this direction. And it says the direction of motion. So that means the velocity in the I component is actually equal to the velocity in the J component. And that way, you're going to get this 45 degree angle here. Maybe not the best way to, to describe that by writing like that. But the VI equal the VJ, and that way you're going to get um, this 45 degree angle. Okay, so we need to do another SUVAT, um, and this time um, we don't know what the initial velocity is, because it's when it leaves A. Um, so in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to find out what the velocity is at the point A. So that will be our initial velocity going forward. Here, I just need to now work out the velocity. So I'm going to use V is equal to U plus AT. And V is equal to U, which was 2 minus 3, plus a, we worked out what the acceleration was. It was 1.5 minus 2. And obviously, it's constant acceleration, so it doesn't change over this period. Multiplied by 2 seconds is when we get to the point we need, which is the point A. So the velocity when we get to point A is going to be on top 3 plus 2 is 5. And minus 4 minus 3 is minus 7. So that's the velocity at point A. So now what we need to do is we need to leave point A. So we need a new SUVAT. And we know the velocity when we leave point A is this. So that becomes the initial velocity. We're told what the acceleration now is. It's 4.8.8. And we are and that's it. That's all that's all we're told. Um okay. Uh but we are told that the velocity component in the I will equal the velocity component in the J at the point we want to inspect. So I'm going to set up a V equals U plus AT. So I'm going to get V is equal to U, which is 5 minus 7, plus A, which is 4, 8.8, .8, multiplied by T. Okay, great. So VI is the top row of that column. And that is 5 plus 4t. 
and VJ is the bottom row, which is minus 7 plus 8.8T. .8 and we're told at the point we want to inspect, those two velocities are the same, and thus it will be moving in a northeasterly direction. So we set them equal to each other. And this is going to give me 12 on this side and 4.8 on that side. So I just divide through uh, 12 by 4.8 and I get 2.5. And I believe that is the final answer. Bosh. Okay, what have we got here? We've got a plank AB of mass M and length 2A rests with its end yeah, blah, 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 against a rough vertical wall. Okay, so a rough vertical wall, that is quite interesting. That means that it's going to have a reactional force like that, and one also coming out like this. So let's call that R1, and this one R2. Um, the plank is held in a horizontal position by a rope. Okay, so we're going to have tension here, going inwards like that, holding up this rod. Um, and we'll also have tension coming back this other way, but this is the one we're looking at, most importantly. Okay, the plank is held, yep, blah, 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 blah. A small block of mass 3M is placed on the plank where X is equal to AP, okay. And that's all interest. Okay, so we've got tan is equal to um, 3 over 4 again. So put alpha there, 3 there, 4 there, 5 there. And we can say that cos alpha is 4 over 5 and sine alpha is 3 over 5. It's a uniform rod, which means there's going to be some mass um, acting at the center. Um, and that's going to act down here and that is M so therefore that's mg the weight and we've also got 3m coming from here so that is 3mg is the weight and I think that's good and I think it says and then using the model show that the tension in the rope is blah 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 okay well let's have a look at where we've got lots of unknown forces which are really not helpful and that is at A, because we've got reaction one going vertically, reaction two going horizontally. I just want to get rid of those so that I can focus on the only force I don't know, which is going to be the T value. So let's do that then. Let's um, take moments at that point. So we say moments at A. And we will have um, the distance um, to the first force is A, and that's mg. So you times those two together. So we get A m g. So we're going to have to keep going up and down here. Um, the next force along is x distance, and that's 3 mg. And they're going in the same direction, so that's plus um, x. 3mg. So those are all working in a clockwise direction and tension is going the other way. Now I'm going to take components of the tension by drawing a line up here. And um, in fact, I won't do it like that. Apologies. I will go across like this and then go up like this. So that it's obvious to see that the angle is pointing at the vertical. So therefore that one is T sine alpha and the angle is adjacent. Sorry, the component here is adjacent to the angle here. So that's T cos alpha. Okay. Um, so going along, it's 2A to get to here and the vertical component is T sine alpha. So these moments must be equal. So that was 2A and that was T sine 
alpha. Okay, that's helpful. And now we just need to solve for t. So over here, we've got m, g, open brackets, a plus 3x is equal to 2a and sine alpha, we said was 3 over 5, t. So we can then divide through by um, 6 over 5 which is the same as writing 5 over 6. And we can also divide through by a as well. So we get this, which I think is as required. OK. Um, just to explain this just one second a little bit more. Um, the reason why we use this one is because even though I've not drawn the component at the point B, all of the components come from the point B here. So I could have drawn this like this instead, and it would have been just as accurate up there, T sine alpha, across there, T cos alpha. OK, um, the magnitude of the horizontal component of the force exerted on the plank at A by the wall is 2mg. OK, so this is 2mg, the horizontal component. Find x in terms of A. So these questions are so formulaic. You do a moment and then afterwards you then resolve um, either horizontally or vertically. So here I'm going to resolve um, horizontally because I've just been given a horizontal force. So what are the horizontal components? Well, we've got T cos alpha working to the left and we've got this 2mg working to the right. So they must be equal to each other because uh, it's in equilibrium, of course. So we can say that T cos alpha is equal to 2mg, with t being this whole boy expression we've got up here. So 5mg a plus 3x over 6a multiplied by cos alpha, which is 4 over 5, is equal to 2mg. OK, and the question is asking us to solve for x. Um, so first thing I will do is just try and do a bit of simplifying. I'm dividing by 5 there, and there's a 5 there. I can um, divide both sides by 2, which gives me a 2 up top there. And if there's a 2 on top there, I can cancel that out and turn this into a 3. And I can also cancel out an mg on both sides. So let's multiply through by 3a, which is going to give me this is equal to 3a multiplied to that side. So that's all been cancelled out, so that's 1. So times through by 3a. Great. So I get 3x is equal to 2a. So I get x is equal to 2a over 3. Perfect. Um, next part, the force exerted on the plank at A by the wall acts in a direction which makes an angle beta with the horizontal. Find the value of tan beta. OK, so essentially, again, these questions are so formulaic. First off, use moments. Secondly, resolve horizontally. Thirdly, you guessed it resolve vertically and that's going to give me my r1 and if I have r1 and I know r2 I can work out what the angle is that they give um, because those are the two components so I can work out what the angle is so what have we got going horizontal uh, vertically We've got r1 going up t sine alpha going up mg going down 
free mg going down. Okay. So we write R1 going up, T sine alpha going up is equal to the ones going down, which is mg and free mg. Okay. Um, so R1 um, is equal to 4mg minus t sine alpha. And t is, again, not the most useful expression in the world. Um, but sure, uh, 5mg um, a... And we can replace this x now, actually, because free x is equal to 2a. Perfect. So rather than writing free x in that bracket, I can write 2a, because free x is equal to 2a, as it says there. That's still all over 6a. And that's multiplied by sine alpha, and sine was 3 over 5. Whew. Okay. So let's solve this. Um, can I spot any shortcuts? A little bit. The 5 can go again. And the 3 and 6 divide through by 3, so that'll make 2. So I can say R1 is equal to 4mg minus um, mg times by 3a divided by 2a. Okay, great. We can cancel these a's now. That's helpful. So we've just got 4mg minus 3 over 2mg. Um, so that is the same as um, what's 4 minus 1.5, so that's 2.5mg. Splendid. Right. And let's not forget um, that the horizontal component is 2mg. And now we know the vertical component is 2.5mg. So we could draw a little triangle to work out what the angle is. So we've got 2mg going across. And we've got 2.5mg going up. So the angle that this vector would make uh, is beta. And it asks us to find tan beta, so we don't actually need to work out the angle. But that's the opposite over the adjacent, um, which is 5 over 4. OK, let's go on to question D. It says the rope will break if the tension in it exceeds 5 mg. Explain how this could restrict the possible positions of P. Justify your answer carefully. Well, P is a distance of x away from A. So let's figure out what x can be given that the tension must be less than or equal to mg. Oh, sorry. 5mg. Now, what was the tension? We had a formula for that. It is right here. So 5mg a plus 3x over 6a. So 5mg a plus 3x over 6a needs to be less than or equal to 5mg. Right, I can divide through by those two, and I can multiply through by 6a. Whoops. To get this, and I can say that 3x is less than or equal to 5a. So x is less than or equal to 5a over 3. So we'll finish by just explaining to the examiner what that means. It means that the x has to be less than or equal to 5a over 3. 
Um, okay, so I mean currently it means that the rope would snap because it's 2A which is greater than 5A over 3 away from A. So we have to say that um, for rope not to break um, block can't be more than 5a over 3 from a. So we're done. Okay, we've got a projectiles question and we have all the information pretty much given on the diagram. It says using the model show that u squared is equal to 2 g sine squared alpha. Okay, so first off what I'll do is just draw on some components. This will be u cos alpha because it's adjacent to the angle and this over here will be u sine alpha because it's opposite the angle. And we know that it has a highest point three meters off the ground. So I can use the vertical direction and I could do a suvat for it. So let's do a suvat in the vertical. So I know that it essentially travels just one meter vertically because it starts at two and we need to get to three. So the distance is one. The initial velocity in the vertical was u sine alpha. And here's the key point. At the maximum height, the vertical velocity equals zero. Because it's not going up anymore, it's not coming down, it's at its maximum, it's reached the top. So at that particular point, the velocity in the vertical is zero. Acceleration in vertical is always minus 9.8. In fact, let's just use G because I'm pretty sure G was included in the um, expression we must give. And time, well, I don't think we need that one. So we've already got four. So the one without T is V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. So we're going to get zero is equal to u squared sine squared alpha plus um, or minus should I say two lots of g times by s which is one okay great so just rearranging this we get u squared is equal to 2g over sine squared alpha as required It says the point T is at a horizontal distance of 20 meters from A and it is at a height of 0 0.75 meters above the ground. The ball reaches T without hitting the ground. Find the size of angle alpha for nine marks. Wowza. Okay, so we know this coordinate position. So we've already looked at the vertical. Let's look at the horizontal now. Okay, so let's do it over here. And let's look at the horizontal and let's do a suvat and see what we know. So in the horizontal, there is never any acceleration because that's all in the vertical with gravity. There's no air resistance. We say zero acceleration in the horizontal. We know that it traveled 20 meters to get to the point T. Um, we don't know the time it takes to get there, so let's call that capital T. And we do know that the velocity, the initial velocity is U um, cos alpha. So let's, um, well let's sub this in, let's see what we get. Um, we will do S equals U T plus a half a t squared. A is zero, so it's just s equals ut. 
So that's 20 is equal to U cos alpha times by, I'm going to call it capital T, which is the time it takes to get to the position T. Okay. So let's now do a, um, a SUVAT for the vertical at the same point. Again, we know that will be the acceleration. It's going to be the same time. And we know how far it's traveled because that is the position it's at a height of 0 0.75. So let's be careful above the ground. Okay, so that distance there is 0 0.75, which means from its position A, if it's now at a height of 0 0.75, that means it's actually dropped down by minus 1.25. So that is how much it's changed its position, minus 1.25. So this is minus 1.25. The initial velocity, um, again, is u sine alpha. And we're never really interested in the final velocity. So we can do an s equals ut plus a half at squared for this. And this is going to give us minus 1.25 is equal to u, which is u sine alpha times by t minus half 9.8 which is 4.9 t squared perfect and seeing as I'm trying to solve eventually for alpha what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute this purple box here for t into this um, equation we've just calculated here. So minus 1.25, and sorry, let's just rearrange this. So that tells me that t is equal to 20 over u cos alpha. So we're going to write um, u sine alpha. t is now times by 20 over u cos alpha minus 4.9 and that will be 20 um, squared which is 400 over u squared cos squared alpha okay right let's try and simplify this down a bit minus 1.25 I'm going to get um, cancel cancel Sine over cos is tan, so I'm going to get equals 20 tan alpha. And I'm going to get, um, actually let me just write this as minus a half g, because I think I know this is going to cancel. This four point, this minus 4.9 was minus a half g. And that's going to be 400 over u squared cos squared alpha. So I want alpha, but I've got a u squared here, which is a problem. But if we go back, we originally found a expression for u squared. So that is going to get replaced. Okay, so let's sub in for u squared. Um, minus 1.25 is equal to 20 tan alpha minus one half g multiplied by 400 over u squared is 2g over sine squared alpha and that's multiplied by cos squared alpha so a little bit messy here but what we can do, because we are 
um, dividing and then dividing again, this sine squared will jump to the top. So a bit of like keep flip change. And that is going to become a multiply. And then we can simplify this a little bit more because sine squared over cos squared is tan squared. So this becomes a tan squared. We are doing g and then dividing by g. So that cancels. And we're dividing by 2, so that's 200. And we're halving it, so that's 100. So I've got minus 1.25 is equal to 20 tan alpha. And then, like I said, minus 100 tan squared alpha. OK. Um, now let me uh, write this as 100 tan squared alpha minus 20 tan alpha minus 1.25. Okay, which equals zero. And then this is not looking like a nice one to factorize, even though I'd love to use the Mr. Packer method at the moment to factorize this. But I think for this, it's much easier just to uh, use the calculator. Maybe in my next video, I will factorize a quadratic using the Mr. Packer method which is the best method of factorizing quadratics. I don't care what anyone says. Okay, so we get tan alpha is equal to 0 0.25, and we get tan alpha is equal to minus 0 0.05. Okay, and then we can find the alpha values. So we're gonna do shift uh, tan of 0 0.25. And that's going to give us 14 degrees. Of course, the next value along would be like you would add 180, so that would not be appropriate. Uh, so, of course, it's going to be an acute angle. And again, if you were to do tan to the minus one of um, that negative value, then you would get a negative angle. Um, so that wouldn't be appropriate. Add on 180, again, that would not be appropriate either. So this is the one. That's our angle. Okay. Um, state one limitation of the model that could affect your answer to part B. And that would be um, air resistance. Just simple enough. that would affect the answer if air resistance was factored in. And final part, find the time taken for the ball to travel from A to T. Okay, so from A to T, we know that is a horizontal distance of uh, 20. So we'll use that. And we're gonna need the initial velocity as well, um, which we can now find uh, using this. Okay, so let's do that. So the initial velocity is going to equal the square root of 2g over sine squared alpha. Okay, so I'll just enter that into my calculator and press enter. And that gives me 18.26. And then if we do the horizontal distance across, we know that 20 is equal to the initial velocity in the horizontal, which is times by cos uh, alpha, and then multiplied by the time taken. So we can find T, and I'll sub that into my calculator now. 
and I get an answer of 1.13 seconds. And we're done. Bosh. If you found it useful, please do like, subscribe, and share. Bye for now.